We're gathered here today to recognize the passing of one Mr. Batman voice, who sadly took his life by overdose of sleeping pills. According to the suicide note found on his nightstand, he couldn't live in a world where more people were commenting on how stupid he was as opposed to commenting on the actual points in the video, and wished to get out of the way so that the show may go on. Also, he had just watched The Apartment, and kind of wanted to see if Jack Lemmon would say it. Goodbye, Batman voice. How little we knew me. So I'm just going to use my normal voice for reading now. You're on your own, suckers! So you should know the format by now. We open with some of the Animorphs doing something really, really stupid and off-topic. And this is a Rachel book, so you know it's going to be something completely unrelated to the Yerks. This time, she goes to a circus, morphs into an elephant, and manhandles the elephant herder for using a cattle prod on the circus elephants. When the rest of the Animorphs learn about it, she naturally gets chewed out, but she still hasn't been st as strongly chewed out as the time she stopped a man from raping her. The Animorphs have a meeting in the woods. It turns out Marco and Tobias have been doing some tag team spy work, following Assistant Principal Chapman everywhere he goes, and after some detective work, discover another entrance into the Yerk Pool. The one in the school had been sealed off after the Animorphs' first visit, all the way back in number one, the invasion, you see. It turns out that it's in the dressing room in the, in the gap at the mall. This information sets off some tension in the group. One, Marco didn't tell anybody he was doing this. Two, Jake is still repressing his feelings concerning becoming a controller in the last book. And three, Axe is fucking blood crazy. Good job, Jake admitted grudgingly. The question is, now what do we do? Attack, Axe said instantly. We tried that once, Cassie said quietly. We didn't exactly win. There were dozens of hork and taxons down there, and human controllers. And he was there. Visitor three. That's when Tobias was trapped in a morph. Like I said, we didn't exactly win. We got hammered, I agreed. Actually, you know, I'm usually all for going on the attack, but the Yerkpool is just too big. A warrior is judged by the power of his enemies, Axe said stubbornly, but he didn't sound quite as enthusiastic anymore. While they can't attack the Yerkpool outright, they still need to use the situation to any advantage they can. Rachel comes up with the idea of spying inside the Yerk Pool for a while and trying to locate the Gondrana, the device that makes the nourishing rays the Yerks survive on. Axe points out that the Gondrana need not actually be at the Yerk Pool, that the rays could be beamed to the Yerk Pool from just about anywhere in the city. It's too tempting of a target to pass up. How much would it hurt the Yerks, I asked. That's the question. Is it worth running the risk of going down there again, down to the Yerk Pool? We all looked at Axe. It would depend. If they have a spare Kondrana, it wouldn't hurt them very much. In any case, they have one aboard their mothership, so we would not wipe them out entirely. We all sagged with disappointment. However, it would not be practical for the Yerks to shuttle their human controllers back and forth to their mothership to keep them alive. So what would they do, Marco wondered. How would Visor 3 react? Visor 3 is totally ruthless, I said. He would save as many as he could, but he'd have to let the rest die. Yes, Axe agreed. It would be a very serious blow. They would survive, but they would be weakened. So the Animorphs make some plans and call it a night. Rachel returns home to discover that her father is coming over for dinner, something that's never happened since Rachel's parents got divorced. From my experience, that either means Rachel's dad is getting remarried, or he's failing fabulous. No, it turns out he's got a new job as a news anchor several states away, effectively reducing quality time with his three daughters from every other week to, eh, whatever. Rachel tries to act like she's okay with this, and does a really bad job at it, and storms off to her room. Rachel's dad comes in and gives her some additional news. If Rachel wants, she can move in with him. And what's more, fictional Olympics gymnastics star Carla Belknikoff lives there, and Rachel's dad thinks he can get fictional Olympics gymnastics star Carla Belknikoff to train Rachel. 
Of course, this also offers Rachel the additional bonus of not being able to fight the Yerks. On one hand, that's a pretty dickish thing to do, ditching her friends like that. On the other hand, the Animorphs list of success include accidentally destroying two insignificant spacecraft and freeing a used car lot's mascot. It's not like they're doing any good anyway. And besides, it's fictional Olympic gymnastics star Carla Belnikoff. Rachel is conflicted and does the natural thing to do when emotions are running high. Go to the zoo and pet a grizzly bear. The next day, the Animorphs go to the mall and systematically morph Roach in the Gap's dressing room. A controller shows up and opens the entrance, and the crew slip in unnoticed. They make their way into the Yerkpool proper, which is thankfully a little less horrifying when viewing it through a Roach's crappy vision. They really don't know where to go to find quality information, so they decide to start things off in, by hiding in a nearby eatery and listening in to some of the diner talk for clues. Unfortunately, Joe's famous pancake breakfast is rather popular with the taxons, who also find cockroaches rather delicious. Before you can say, Hey, you call this coffee? The animals are jumped and swallowed by a taxon. Well, you don't get much more owned than that. Thankfully, someone dumped a big stinking pile of omniscient powers on the situation. Time magically stops, and the animals are magically forced to demorph. And look, Tobias is there, back in human form. The animals, confused, wander onto the eatery into the yerk pool proper, and nothing is moving. Time has completely stopped. Is this some trick of Visitor 3's? This is not Yerk technology, I can tell you that, Max said. This is far beyond them, far beyond us Andalites as well. What? Humility? From an Andalite? Yeah, Marco screamed. The voice came from everywhere at once, and from nowhere. It wasn't a voice, not really. It wasn't even thought speak. It was like an idea that simply popped in your head. The words exploded like bursting balloons inside your own thoughts. I spun around, looking for the source, ready to fight if necessary. No, Rachel! There is no threat! He knows your name, Tobias hissed. I glanced at Axe. He had gone rigid. He wasn't frozen like the, all the world around us. He was afraid. He was shaking. Axemali, Escarut, Hithel, has begun to guess what I am! Elemist, Axe said. Do not be afraid. I will appear in a physical form you can understand. The air directly in front of me... No, not in front, behind, beside, around. I can't explain it. The air just opened up, as if, as if there were a door in nothingness, as if air were solid, and... It is just impossible to explain. The air opened. He appeared. He was humanoid. Two arms, two legs, a head where a human head would be. His skin was glowing blue, as if he were a light bulb that had been painted over, so that light still shone from him. He looked like an old man, but with a force of energy that was definitely not frail. His hair was long and white, his ears were swept up in the points, his eyes were black holes that seemed to be full of stars. I am the Elemist, he said, speaking with an actual voice, as your Andalite friend has guessed. So yes, we got ourselves an all-powerful being, because no science fiction franchise is good without one. He stopped time because he's got a proposition for the Animorphs. They're 100% screwed! The Eryx will conquer Earth regardless of what the Animorphs do. However, the Elemis wants to preserve some of the life from the planet, and is willing to transplant the Animorphs, their families, and some other select humans, to a planet where they can live in peace. He takes them on a quick magic world tour, in effect not dissimilar from watching a National Geographic documentary on IMAX. After that shot of perspective, the Elemis gives the Animorphs the choice of getting the Noah treatment or not. They're conflicted, to say the least. They have no reason to trust the Elemis, and if they turn him down, they go straight back to the taxon's belly. Not exactly a fair scenario. Then again, their families might be safe. And as I said way back in my review of Number Two, The Visitor, their families are what they're really fighting for here. While they're debating it out, Rachel notices a large tube next to the eatery and recognizes it as a drop shaft, a mind-controlled magic alien elevator that the Animorphs used on the Yerk mothership back in Number Five, The Capture. Continuity! Eventually, the Animorphs decide not to take the Elemis' deal, and are sent back to the Taxon's belly in cockroach form, and time starts up again. However, their little chat with an all-powerful old dude gives them enough tr breathing time to get their game together. They demorph inside the Taxon, causing it to burst, much like the condom your dad was using when you were conceived, 
Their identity is concealed in taxon guts and the fact that the Yerks don't apparently believe in security cameras. They make a quick run out of the eatery and morph into combat morphs. And for Rachel, that means trying out her new yogi morph for the first time. The bear turns out to be an even better ass kicker than the elephant. But Rachel gets so caught up in the fight, she loses herself and almost attacks Jake in tiger form. She eventually regains control, the Animorphs reach the drop shaft, and thankfully there's no override for these things because the Animorphs reach the outside and escape.